inferences, guesses of the climate truth, and we deal with uh, environmental data, climate data, that means noisy data, that means our guesses are not exact. We make errors, uncertainties. This is inevitable. And, uh, but we are not lost. We can quantify. Is it a, a, a small error we make or is it a, a big error? So you have to report the, the uncertainties. This is the duty of us, of applied researchers. And I will uh, try to tell you how to determine these uncertainties and explain to you the climate data and the analysis methods. Um, so normally the, the course, this is a full course on the full book, nine chapters or five days. And today we have just one day. And um, that means I have to skip many, many things from the book. And it's better, I decided, that uh, what I present you can understand than uh, to put in as much as possible. Um, still, um, if you have the feeling that I'm proceeding too fast, let me know. I'm here to uh, help you as, as good as I can and uh, it's not a, a problem at all if I have to repeat uh, things. You, the easiest would be if you raise your, your hand and I, I have you here on, on this uh, screen. On that screen is uh, where I show the, the, the slides. Uh, then I will recognize it and um, I, I listen to your needs. Okay, so in southern Lower Saxony, in northern Germany, we have cold weather today and um, I'm excited to, to give this lecture. So let me start. And uh, we study climate. We come from different angles, from geography or physics, and um, we are interested in well, different aspects of the climate, different scales, different space and time scales, regional climate in southeast Europe, or maybe um, a local climate in Novi Sad or here in Heckenbeck where I live. Also the time scales, uh, long term, back in time, millions of years or so, paleoclimate, so you will get some examples from paleoclimate today, but also the more regional, um, uh, sorry, the more recent uh, interval, the instrumental period, the past 150 years, and then the very um, recent uh, uh, interval where we have many data points, okay? And then, of course, we can look with the help of climate models into the future. Evidently, the future is uncertain and we don't know exactly what happens. But nevertheless, we are not lost. We can use machines and um, our knowledge to try our best to look what the climate future may bring us. Okay, statistics, time series analysis, this is a, an idea, a concept to study in a quantitative manner something about the climate. Um, that means uh, it belongs to the field of statistics. And uh, of course, we need a, a computer, a machine, which does the calculations. Um, so it's, therefore, it's important uh, for me that you recognize this is just a, a bloody machine which does what you tell him or her. Okay, so it, we do an implementation. We make a, a software, we write it, then we use it. Or, of course, we use software written by others. So perhaps you will read the software and get the software I will give you. Is there a comment? Okay. And as Z, you will have mathematical formulas and uh, no sweat, I'll walk you through. So the book has nine chapters, as I told you, and today I focus on the introduction, chapter one. And then I have to see how we proceed whether we deal with persistence, which is chapter two. With persistence, uh, we speak about memory, um, cold today, cold tomorrow, and so on. And then chapter three is what I call the hardcore statistics chapter. Lots of formulas and, um, well, advanced concepts. But I think we have the chance to uh, slightly dip into this uh, chapter to get some very basic uh, understanding about statistical science. And then, well, 
I'm not sure whether we will make it to chapter four, regression, which is one um, statistical method to determine trends, long-term changes. So I think it's the best if we just study and begin with the introduction. Okay, this is an empty page. Um, I have also to learn about the, the software here. This is, uh, the software is called Brabob PDF and I can make notes, so I, but I'm new to that and perhaps I make some errors, so I beg your pardon in advance for that. Let me get a coffee. Now we see here a climate time series. In fact, we see two time series. So this here, this is a horizontal axis. This is a time axis. And you see some numbers, 400 and 300 and so, and you see also the label H and then this expression K, KA, which stands for kilo years. Or this is the same as a thousand years. Okay, so we can look back in time for about 420,000 years. This is a time axis. And the, the vertical axis, we have two panels, one here and the other there. So one is CO2, carbon dioxide, um, contained, so this is a gas, which is contained in air bubbles. So today we have in the air and we have about 400 and a bit more PPMV, which stands for parts per million by volume. Okay, that means a 400 and no, sorry, a 400 PPMV. This is a current um, level, which is maybe here. But you see that in the past, in the past several hundred thousand years, we had lower CO2. So this is a, a record from a, from an archive. It's a natural archive, it's an ice core. And the ice core is drilled from Antarctica, the southern hemisphere. Um, because then you have precipitation comes and this is Antarctica. And then the, the ice uh, settles and uh, you drill the core. And this is young or recent, and this is old on the bottom. Okay, and then you take this material into your lab and then you take the air bubbles, and then you measure the CO2 content on the air bubbles. A huge technological effort behind. And this document, this uh, record from the Vostok station, as I said, that the CO2 uh, did some changes in the past. So here, here it is lower and here it's uh, higher. Okay. Um, and uh, these changes are accompanied by changes in the upper um, parameter. This is delta D, which stands for deuterium. Deuterium is, so to say, the heavy brother of the ordinary age. Okay? Age is a hydrogen, which usually has just, a, just one, um, well, proton. And, but sometimes you can have an additional neutron, then you would call this H2, which is the same as D, deuterium, okay? Um, and this record is also from, an I, from, the, from the Vostok I score, and it uh, tells us, well, we are not so much interested in the deuterium, um, the deuterium indicates temperature, temperature in the air. And the air above the Vostok side, that means uh, in Antarctica, and um, well, which is representative for the whole Antarctic uh, Peninsula and maybe even uh, for the southern hemisphere. So, of course, uh, people take this for, for um, well, for temperature indication. And we see basically here that we have warm temperatures here and cold here. Okay, so this is uh, something we have to buy. We 
we have to believe we, we get this information from the colleagues who work on proxy series. I explain in a, a few slides later what is a proxy series. Because it's clear, we are dealing here with the Antarctic um, situation 420,000 years back in time. There are no thermometers. Therefore, we have to employ natural archives and um, measure um, variables which indicate past climates, such as CO2 in air bubbles, which represents atmospheric CO2, or deuterium in the ice material, which represents air temperature. And this record documents that we have in the past, we had big changes in CO2 and in uh, temperature. So you, of course, you know about the current situation that the human greenhouse gas experiment leads to very large values of CO2. And uh, at least we know that CO2 and temperature are related on the short time scale, but also on the longer time scale, on the ice ages. So this are, is a paleo record which documents the ice ages. So this is one. Also, Sorry, maybe I should, uh, let me um, use uh, another color and um, because I, I should give you the, the notation again, which I, I overwrote here. T of i, this is a time value and x of i, this is a thing we measured. Okay, and then we make these uh, curly braces. And the counter is I, which runs from one to N. And N is uh, the sample size, okay? We have N data points. Later we have a look at the caption for that figure. So this is figure 1.4 from the book. Um, well, you don't have the full book. It's a commercial product. It's rather expensive. But you have in the re reading material uh, a selection of the book, which includes the full introduction and then uh, from the other chapters, uh, some several pages. And you also have the full uh, references. That means the cited literature. So you can have uh, a look in the, that PDF for figure 1.4, and then you will see that figure here and you have also the caption okay the caption is the well which gives the details the text so make that small and now we proceed so this was one the notation and the second thing we have to accept or assume is what i call the climate equation climate comprises trend extremes and noise so this here is the trend. These are the extremes or the outliers. And this uh, is the noise uh, component. That means not all the data points are nicely lying on a, on a certain straight line, on the trend line. Um, perhaps we have some extremes. Okay, so if that is time and that is x, not all the points are nicely sitting on that straight on that straight line. We have a variations around the trend, okay? And this is uh, therefore this is called the noise. The noise stands for everything we don't know. We just say, well, we can't. Uh, there are so many influences, uh, natural systems, weather, chaos, and so. Therefore, we use the statistical concept of noise of a random variable, which represents these many unknown influences. Okay, so this is what I call the climate equation. So cap T is the time, X is the observed climate variable, for example, CO2. X trend is the trend component, then we have the outlier or extreme component. And then you see that I wrote the noise component as a product. S of T times X noise of T. And S is the variability that stands for, let me use another color. So 
So if S, the variability would be small, then the variations would be small around the trend. And if S would be large, then we would have large variations around the trend. That means we can quantify the climate also in terms of the variability, large variations or small variations. So this is important to um, kind of um, characterize climates. So the definition of climate is the long-term mean, the trend, but also the variability around the trend. Yeah, this is S of T. And this is a new thing, the outlier component, which I brought into the climate equation. Um, and that means um, one should think about also about the definition of climate in terms of extremes because these are getting more and pro more prominent. We are getting perhaps also better data to analyze extremes. And therefore, um, in these decades of climate change and uh, extreme events, one should uh, think about adopting such a definition. So this was uh, the climate equation in continuous time, um, but our data points are, well, discrete time, and a finite number of points at certain time values. And therefore, let us use this equation in discrete time, which is shown here. Okay, x of i is now a, a value, for example, 420 ppmv or 280 and so. And instead of x of t of i, I write x of i. So this is this abbreviation. T of I, I are now the time points. So this is the same equation, the same information content as before, but now written in discrete time. Um, okay, the, you see the words climate equation. Um, you could think that this is derived, an equation derived from physical laws or so. No way. There's no, no chance to derive such an equation from, from physics because the climate is way more complex. We have many um, compartments, the biosphere, the cryosphere, ice, the hydrosphere, rivers and uh, oceans. And uh, we have the atmosphere and the tectonics and the soil and everything. And we have many variables and they interact with each other non-linearly. Um, and th this means it's a chaotic uh, system. It's difficult to predict. You're, you can't believe um, the weather forecast for more than maybe a, a week or so. It's impossible to make a longer term um, good predictions because of the, the chaotic uh, system of the, the, the climate. Okay, therefore it's also not possible to write down an equation and derive it from first laws of physics. This is a concept of mine, the climate equation, to describe what uh, I observe, others observe in, in nature. Okay, um, so I honor the definition of climate in terms of the, the trend, and uh, so then we have a variability which may be small or large, and then more and more prominent are the, the extreme events. Okay, and then the task is to analyze the series, to learn about the system that generated the data, to learn about the climate. This is the third thing we, we need. The first was, let me go back. The first is a notation, okay, T of I, X of I. This is one you need for this course. The second is the climate equation in continuous or discrete time. And now the third is the separation between what statisticians call the sample level, the numbers, the time series, small t, small x, and the process level, the climate, the data generating system, cap x. Okay? So we make an inference from here, from the sample, to the process. We are less interested in our bloody sample. We want to know about the climate, about the system. We can make more and more measurements. We can increase the sample size, obtain better data, and so, but we are interested in, in the climate. 
That means we wish to learn about the process. This is a task of statistical science. And that can mean concretely to estimate trend parameters. How much temperature, um, what is the temperature rise per, per decade? Is it a, a, a 0.5 degrees or what is it? What is the probability of a, a flood uh, at the Danube or something like this? Is it changing over time? Is there an influence of, of climate? Are there cycles uh, in the data? Of course, we, we know the daily cycle and the yearly cycle, but perhaps there are other cycles as well, associated maybe with the, the moon or the, the planets and such things. So this is uh, the, this stuff here, the inference from the, the, the guess of, from the climate data on the process that generated the data, this is the field of statistical science, inferential statistics. And in this course, we do this, we learn about this inference in two basic uh, settings, the univariate, and uh, perhaps also in, we have an example from the bivariate setting. Univariate means we have just one variable, x against time. Okay, and then we, we still can do inference. We can quantify the trend and we look for the extremes and, uh, and so on. So the book has uh, three chapters on the univariate setting and then two chapters on the bivariate setting. Um, so evidently you are free then, of course, after the course to recap and uh, study what you, you learned. And then you will uh, see, maybe you have a chance to have a look in, in the book from your library um, and you see then how these different inferences can be achieved. Okay, now we deal a bit with uh, paleoclimate. Anyone heard about uh, paleoclimate or are you familiar with? Well, we see here on the horizontal axis a, a time range. Um, okay, so and we see also the geological epochs, the Holocene, and this is uh, years before present. So this is 10 to the power of zero, which is one. Okay, and this is then 10 years, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 years, a million years. So here we speak about the the Pliocene and the Pleistocene epoch, and we can go further and further back in time. So this here, we, we are speaking here now about billions of years. And um, we can go back until, well, our age, Earth was, was formed. <laughs> so uh, has anyone an idea how old our Earth is? What is the... Well, it should be larger than 10 to the power of nine years, but uh, anyone knows uh, the number? Maybe in the chat. Or say that out loud. 4.6, yes, very good. I like that. You're, you're very close too. And uh, of course, one does not exactly know. You have to take uh, samples and uh, make assumptions. But this is a very good guess. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, and we still can make inference about uh, such a... Uh, past climates with the help of natural archives. And one archive type is a marine sediment core, and the other we have just seen is an ice core. So the oldest ice core, it is from Antarctica and it goes back. Well, let me ask again, anyone an idea how far back the oldest ice core goes at the moment? Milica, you try again. Excuse me, the others may as, as, as well try. Well, let me give you the, the answer. It is uh, 800,000 years, 800 kilo years. This is called the Epica ice core. This is a kind of successor to the Vostok ice core we, we just uh, saw. So there exist um, papers uh, with older eyes, but these are just uh, spotlights um, for, I think it's, it's 1.5 million years or so. But it's not continuous. 
And the Epica record is a continuous record for the past 800 uh, kilo years. So it's a fantastic record, which uh, shows what we saw from the, let me go back. It's interesting for, so this is extended here from 400 now back to 800, okay? And this still the pattern is there. And the Epica record uh, documents this. And of course, people are desperately looking for older eyes. Um, uh, because then we, we have more long-term information. There was also a, a major climate change at around 900,000 years ago, which is called the mid-Pleistocene climate transition. So we speak about the Ice Age climate. And the question is, is that climate transition associated with changes in CO2? And at the moment, we have only conjectures, no hard evidence, because we lack a long ice cores. And therefore, people uh, look on Antarctica with the help of seismic measurements. Is there a, a chance for obtaining a longer ice core further back in time? Okay, and uh, I have not seen uh, a continuous record that extends to a million year, years uh, back in time. Anyhow, with the help of marine sediment cores, you can further look back in time. You see that here, that the arc shading goes back, well, 10 to the power of 7 or, or 8 years. That means several tens or maybe several hundreds of millions of years. So we can look pretty far back in time. So this is an archive. Well, why does it contain the, the climate information and in a marine sediment core? So if that um, is an ocean floor, and that is uh, the water surface. Okay, then the, the material falls down and it accumulates here. And this is young. And on the bottom it's old. And you drill a core. It's easy to say drill a core. You have to take a ship and uh, go, go to that place. And then through the water, maybe two or three thousand meters, you drill then... Uh, you, you put the, the machine and then you, you drill a core of a length of a couple of hundred meters, perhaps. So it's a, quite a, a technological effort. And the, there exist um, programs, ocean drilling programs and the deep sea drilling projects. So these were initiated in the 1960s. And then now we have uh, the ocean discovery program. I forgot exactly the how the exact name is. Anyhow, so this is being done and... Uh, continuously done and new sites are spotted on on the o ocean floor where it's interesting to drill cores so a lot of money and uh, um, technological effort and men and women power goes into into that okay and there are other examples um, shown here okay and um well, maybe this is interesting. I will later make uh, an excursion to these documents. What do I mean with documents? I mean uh, historical documents, okay? So the humans also made notes um, and they handwritten notes perhaps about climate or ex extreme events. And uh, I had the pleasure of collaborating with um, people working on historical climate documents and we produced a flood record for the river Elbe, which is uh, in Germany uh, one of the major rivers. Okay? Okay, now I see here um, questions. Good. Excuse me, I will just uh, read the, the questions and try to answer it. How much does it cost to make one core in the ocean? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the order is we speak about uh, tens of, of of millions of, of euros, I, I would guess. Usually, um, so the different nations, USA and European nations, they fund the, the ocean discovery program. I would guess they have a, a budget of a few billion, perhaps, uh, per year. <laughs> I'm not sure. And then uh, the ship runs 24-7 and the 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 men on, on the ship have to work and get the salary. And then the, the scientists, usually, they are working at the university and they apply then for ship time and they get, if they are lucky, the, 
the proposal through and then they, they go to the ship and um, we speak about uh, several tens of, of, of millions, I would guess. Next question, what is the difference between the information we can get from ice core versus marine sediment? apart from the period of time? Yes, thanks. Well, one answer immediately is um, CO2. Well, of course we can try also to employ marine sediment cores to have a clue about past CO2 values. Um, and this goes via um, carbon-13. Well, that means you have the marine sediment core and you have then, let me go to the next uh, page, I have more place to, to draw there. In the marine sediment core, you have then material, calcium carbonate material, so you, from your, your core, calcium carbonate CO3, and that means you have a Z, and C comprises usually the 12 C, the usual thing, but sometimes you have also 13 C, one neutron more. And um, how much 13 C you have, well, it depends. It depends on also on the, on the um, um, carbon cycle and this perhaps also the CO2 in the atmosphere. Depends a bit on, on what exact um, archive you study, but at least you can use this ratio and standardize it and that and depending also on which material and you use algae remains and on that you measure this stuff and this is then an indicator of co2 but you can imagine um, that this information on co2 is an clearly less good than CO2 measured in air bubbles. Because in air bubbles you have preserved the air, the ancient air, which is a great thing. And therefore, uh, marine um, sediment cores are, in my view, not so well suited for CO2 measurements. Um, of course, I have uh, colleagues who work hard on improving the indicator quality of, of variables measured on marine sediment cores for CO2. But uh, honestly speaking, I think uh, it's difficult to beat the ice cores in terms of CO2 measurement quality. Um, okay. Other things, maybe here, uh, other, uh, a second answer to Julia, the difference between the information we get, can get from ice cores and marine sediment cores, apart from the period of time. One is, this is a period of time she's referring to, we speak here about millions of years, while uh, here we speak about um, uh, hundreds of thousands of years, so we can look further back in time, yes. But there's another thing I, I noted, namely the time resolution, okay? This is here 10 to the power of 3,000 years. This is a typical um, distance in time between two samples for marine sediment cores. But with the ice cores, you see, we, we are here, okay? And depending a bit on the, what mm, machine you have and what variable you measure, you can have resolutions up to one year, 10 to the power of zero is one, one year. One year, this is a factor of thousand. Therefore, you can retrieve um, high, um, fast variations in time from the ice cores. You can't see those with uh, marine sediment cores. Well, of course, people, well, let me give an e example. Um, from Greenland, in the year 1993 or so, there are papers which document very fast changes in Greenland air temperature. With fast, I mean in the order of a few years. We have um, dramatic changes dramatic warmings. These events are called the danskart oeschger events. Um, and this was a kind of a, a kind of a shock for the paleoclimatologists. They, they discovered um, they were not aware of that because the marine sediment cores, they could not resolve it. 
they did not uh, give such a clear um, clue. And therefore, it, uh, Greenland documented really um, new things, new insights into how paleoclimate may have worked. So if you look in the, in the book, um, in the references, let me see whether I have, I have an index in the, in the end. I have to check for the Danskart Oeschgar events. The index should also be in your reading material. Yeah. So, well, this is here under D. And we see that we have a, a couple of pages devoted to these uh, events. So this is also new information from the ice course, thanks to the high resolution we have. Okay. Other questions? No. So I will proceed now. And evidently, there are other... That maybe I, I switch to, to red. Then we have the tree rings, of course, and we have lake sediment cores and spilio themes. Very different uh, archives, and people work on, many people in paleoclimate work on just the one archive. They go to the field, to the caves, and take um, spilio themes to sample the, the past climates. And they measure then 18O, okay, which is also a, a proxy, an indicator variable for, for climate. So 18O, let me just um, mention this. Usually you have 16O. You have a, a bit of 17O as well, but you have more 18O, okay? And then, and this relation between both you express as a value which is called delta 18O, okay? So the ratio of 18O versus 16O in a sample compared to the ratio in a standard, okay? The standard is from some material um, which, you, which you know well and which has a certain um, defined, um, uh, ratio and then you can compare and express the delta 18 O values in your sample. Okay, and um, and this it can be shown that this delta 18 O has something to do with uh, the ice volume. Well, maybe I I take my time now and uh, explain to you um, this uh, delta 18 O that that how climatologists work with proxies. I have to um, put a, another um, page here in. So, excuse me, I have to, to do this. I go to page. I have to check whether I'm able. No, this is... No. Hmm. Oh, I had I had one empty page, um, so I go back here. You see that I'm not. No. I need an empty page. Okay, there are more of this stuff here. I beg your pardon, I'm, I'm not so used to this. Not this. Okay. Mm. 
I beg your pardon. I'm not uh, able to do it so easily. So let me try to explain this delta 18O proxy variable here. Okay. So we have the globe. This is north. This is south. This is the equator. The sun goes mostly on the e equator. That means the temperature is here higher and the air is elevated. Okay? And it has, it contains water, H2O. Okay? And then uh, this travels to the higher latitudes. Okay? And occasionally it rains. Okay, rainfall. And um, now this O contains 18 O and it consists also of 16 O. And um, it's cheaper, so nature prefers the cheap solutions if first this um, 18 O is preferred. A lot of delta 18 O lot of 18 O, okay? And then fewer, 18 O is smaller than here and so on. And then in the northern hemisphere, we have the ice. And the ice, therefore, most of the 18 O has gone away. And therefore, the 18 O is pretty small in the ice, ice, okay? Um, and this is a typical situation. The ice on the, on the polar caps is isotopically light. Okay, let us assume this conveys the current interglacial, a warm climate. And let me now show the situation for the climate. In the climate, we have more ice, okay? That means um, more than 18 O. That means the ocean in the, in the glacial, this is a glacial, and this is an interglacial IG. This is warm, okay? Now, in a, and therefore, in a glacial, the most of the 18 O is located in the ice. That means in a glacial, in the ocean, 18 O is small. Uh, let me see. Yeah. And in an interglacial, in the interglacial, 18O, I think I confused it. I have to check it again. A anyhow, uh, this is a relation between 18O and, uh, and climate. I think I should rather proceed now to, to show you more. Okay, so this is a, the task of uh, in, in paleoclimate. You use natural archives, you use proxy to make an inference. This is figure 1.4 from the book. We have CO2 and we have deuterium measured on ice cores. This is figure 1.4. It has a caption and the caption gives you the details. It explains the delta notation. It gives you the number of points, 3311. For the deuterium, we have 283 for the... Um, for the CO2. Also, you know that um, these values, they go up only to about 300 ppmv. At the moment, uh, we have uh, over 400, okay? Uh, and uh, therefore, these ice core can't, um, can't uh, measure the current uh, value well, because it's a paleoclimate record. The spacing is in the order of a few thousand years. Okay, if you want to know about the current uh, 
CO2 value, you have to use uh, other measurements, okay? More recent uh, measurements. Okay, it's a lengthy very uh, caption and uh, you can, um, of course, study it in, in your um, uh, leisure time. Let me proceed now with uh, noise and statistical distribution. Um, okay, usually in that uh, lecture we have um, formulas and uh, often we also have a figure and we usually start then with the figure. So this is a, this figure is a curve, f, a function, independence on x, f of x, which is denoted to give you the probability of observing some values. So the probability is pretty small for observing large values and it's also small for observing small values. And in the middle you have the highest probability. So the full area integrates to it is equal to 100% and um, in the shaded area here is uh, the probability for observing a variable x between a and a plus delta. And this is therefore the area under the curve. And you had in school, in, in your mathematics um, lessons or maybe in university, the area under the curve, this is the, called the integral. So this is the same, this is a figure here and this is a, the formula here. The integral gives you the probability for observing a certain value. Okay, and um, you see also a certain shape of that um, curve. It has a it has what is called a Gaussian or a normal shape. It is symmetric, okay, um, to the left as to the right. And um, this is an assumption which holds for many variables also in climate but not for all variables and uh, often in climate you, we see deviations from Gaussianity or from the normal shape and we will study now we have a look at some examples from paleoclimate. Now this is a, a plot figure 1.12 from the book it has six panels and each panel shows a histogram of the random component of a time series. And this here, B, is Vostok CO2. And we observe, and the histogram basically is a measure, a tool. You look how many points are within a certain size class. And um, for example, here in this class, uh, maybe 62 or so uh, and it runs from minus um, a to plus 2 or so and um, yeah and we have a total number of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 classes okay this is Vostok CO2 and Vostok deuterium would be that one and here you have the impression is it a symmetric curve anymore is it a as, as before well you here perhaps from my tone that I don't think it's symmetric. We have more power, more um, numbers to the right than to the left. Okay, that means it is a skewed distribution. A skewness, a right skewed distribution. More larger values than as smaller values. So this is a typical shape for the distribution of the random component in climate series on different time scales. It can be on paleoclimate, but also um, imagine that, that you deal with rainfall at Novi Sad perhaps. It can't be below zero, but you have situations where you have a lot of rainfall. Okay, so by, it is bounded by zero rainfall and it can have, you can have pretty large values. So it's a typical shape, a right skewed shape for rainfall and also for the paleoclimate uh, data. This is, uh, and these are obtained, these values are obtained on the, what is called the residuals. Um, I explain later how they are obtained. Be in mind at the moment these are numbers which represent the noise component. We get rid of the trend on, 
of the data points, each rendered version of the data. Okay, now um, persistence or memory. Um, this is now a mathematical expression and uh, I mean with memory the following. If it's cold today, colder than on average, um, then what is, a, what is with, the, with tomorrow? Is it cold again? Is it warm again? Or what is with your place that you are currently living? Is it warmer than on average? What is your impression? Is it warmer or is it colder? I have no idea about your weather. Colder? Let me see whether one writes it in the, in the chat. It's colder. Colder, colder. Another? Branislav Milica? Colder? Um, now, now I offer you a, a bet. Uh, you have to, about the temperature tomorrow. If you would have uh, to place a, a bet and I ask you tomorrow, will it, will it be colder than on average or will it be warmer? What would you be your reply? Warmer? Other opinions? So, Nena, do you think it's warmer? Um, other? One is colder, or at least not colder, okay. <laughs> um, well, let me repeat the question, and uh, now we speak about hours. Today, at this hour, now we are at uh, close to 10 o'clock, it's still colder than on average at 10 o'clock on this day. Um, what is this in, in, in an hour at 11 o'clock? Will it be colder or warmer? Well, it will be warmer, of course, because uh, the sun rises, yes. But uh, if you subtract this daily cycle, will it then be still warmer? No, it will be colder. It will still be below the average. Also, the average for 11 o'clock will be warmer than the average at 10 o'clock. Um, or let us take uh, the weather forecast, temperature at Novi Sad. Uh, you, you watch the news in the evening and then um, the guy tells you, oh, we have pretty cold weather and uh, it, it persists till tomorrow, but on the weekend we get a, it, it, it gets a bit warmer. Okay? Um, so you would perhaps believe the guy in the, for a few days, but what is if the maybe a new TV channel opens and they want to make a better um, or more advanced weather forecast and then they speak about the weather in four weeks time. Do you believe them? Yes or no? No, no. No one would believe this. Exactly. Because you can't make such long-term predictions. Okay, well at the moment, of course, people are trying desperately to make your long-term predictions. So I myself, for example, I booked now um, holidays in, in Denmark uh, and we are not sure about whether we are able to, to swim. Well, I have no problems with thing, swimming in 15 degrees cold water, but my wife is <laughs> not so much uh, after that. Anyhow, we, we, we don't know the, the weather in, in, uh, in, in a month or four months. That means uh, Climate or weather, it memorizes to some degree over a certain time length, but not uh, infinitely long. Okay? And therefore, um, we have to, we can quantify this. And the, this is a, a formula here which helps us. It is called autocovariance. So, what is this? This is a product. This is maybe, um, this is today, okay? T1 today and T2 is tomorrow. Okay, and X, let us, this is temperature, 
Okay, let, let us take uh, maybe at, at, at seven in the morning. Okay, um, and now we take the, the product. Cold today, that means colder than on average. We speak about the noise component. Noise. No trend, okay? No daily cycle and so on. So if the noise component today would be negative and tomorrow cold again would also be negative, then you have something negative times something negative which gives something positive, okay? Minus one times minus one is plus one. On the other hand, let us uh, assume we are uh, maybe in a in uh, four weeks time and the, the weather is good, then it would be maybe positive in, in four weeks time and the day after four weeks time would then again be positive. It's again positive. Okay? That means, uh, and this here, this is called the expectation operator. This is so to say the random game over all outcomes, if I may. So this is not a mathematical expression, but I hope it conveys, conveys what I, I wish to, to say. You don't know exactly the true values, but on average you would get this. Okay? If it's cold, it will stay cold. If it's warm, it will stay warm over a certain time length. Okay? And therefore, this is positive. The autocovariance is positive. That means the memory, cold today, cold tomorrow, um, can be put into a parameter which is a positive, which is called the memory parameter or the persistence time or the autocorrelation parameter. Okay, there exist different ways to express this. I will, we will have the chance to have a, a mathematical description on that in chapter two after we made a, a break. But we can already now have a look um, on the paleo data whether they also exhibit persistence or memory. And uh, this is uh, done in figure 113 of the book. And again, this is Vostok CO2. And what uh, are plotted here are called leg one scatter plots. So these are six scatter plots and uh, in each plot on the vertical axis we plot x of i, sorry x of i minus one against x of i. This is now for Vostok CO2 but uh, imagine for a second that we deal with temperature at Novizat, um, daily temperature so this would be the temperature, um, let us say this is today, and this would be then yesterday, and uh, today cold, yesterday cold, then you would sit somewhere here, negative, negative. Or maybe we are in a period where temperature were higher, and then maybe, uh, let us say three months ago, it was warm, and. That means the random component was higher. And then the day before it was also warm, then we speak about this uh, area. So we have an orientation of the points along this one-to-one -one line, along the gray line. So um, we can visualize persistence, we can visualize memory with the help of such leg one scatter plots. And as before, we speak about the numbers which represent the noise component. That means we have no trend in the data, we have removed the trend and we have also got rid of n daily cycle or a yearly cycle. We speak about the, the random component, okay? And you see that also in the paleo climate, so this is a temperature in, in Vostok, um, also that uh, memory is seen. Okay, and later in chapter two, we make uh, mathematical models for that memory. Because this is uh, the second thing important for the study of climate time series. One is the distribution, let me go back. Okay, the Gaussian distribution, 
which is likely violated for climate data, we have often a right skewed distribution as here, more to the right and to the left, rainfall, um, but also 18O and so. And the other thing is the memory. Cold yesterday, cold tomorrow, cold today, and um, warm today, warm tomorrow. And this also holds on other time scales as well, not only on daily time scale, but perhaps also on longer term. Warm a thousand years ago, warm this year, and then warm in another thousand years. Evidently, there are more uncertainties on this longer time scale, but you still can observe in these plots document this memory on longer time scales. That means the, the climate data, they show these two, what I call the peculiar aspects, which make life um, difficult for analysis of the data. Non-Gaussian distributions and persistence or memory. And the statistics has to deal with these properties to do, well, good inferences. Okay, a, a word now, later we have the formulas on the residuals, a word on the residuals. We have the climate equation and we have the data and we make an inference from here to there. Using time series analysis, we determine the trend and we detect the outliers and we quantify the variability S of i. And then once we've done this, then we can subtract the trend, get rid of this, remove the outliers and then divide also by the variability. And the numbers that result, they represent this random component. Okay, and this random component, let me repeat, this typically shows deviations from the Gaussian shape, namely in the form of a right skewness, and it also exhibits persistence or memory on different time scales. Okay, there are more details behind this in uh, this estimation in chapters three and four, and uh, we have to see how far we can get today um, to learn about how this can be achieved, this estimation. Let me now proceed. Um, and uh, let me first ask you, because this helps me to learn about how much into details I should go here. Is any one of you working with paleoclimate data or perhaps he or she wishes to study in the future paleoclimate? Yes, Rasto, I hope, Milicha hopes as well, good. Okay, it's, it's great to, to hear because I also, well, I, I started with, with paleo climate uh, data and um, analysis of such data. Um, and uh, so my approach to, um, and my, what I can bring to climate sciences is I develop methods, statistical methods, inferential methods, and my hope is that the methods can be applied to the more recent climate, the extremes in Southeast Europe over the past few years and into the next future. But also the methods can be applied on longer time scales, back in time. Trend estimation is always a useful and detection of extremes as well. That means um, the paleoclimatologists and also the people who work with weather data uh, and the near uh, future climate. And you can, all of you can learn from climate time series analysis. And since uh, we have now some of you interested in paleoclimate, I invest a, a bit of time also on another aspect, which is called the spacing. The spacing is a variable which uh, I abbreviate with a D of I, which is defined as, well, as here, the difference between two consecutive time points. This is the time spacing. Okay, and um, the average of all time points, this is called D bar. Okay, so if, let me show you, if you, the, the series, if your time points, they are from one to N, okay, 
So you have different uh, spacings. So first spacing D of D of one is therefore um, T of two minus T of one. D of two is given by T of three minus T of two and so on. And D of N minus one is given by T of N minus t of n minus 1 okay and the, the average spacing d bar would be then t of n minus t of 1 divided by n minus 1 so this is uh, the formula how it is uh, being de defined um, okay, but now let us look on the, the time spacing and how it depends on time, how it has changed for the paleoclimate um, data. Okay, this is figure 116 from the book. Again, this here is Vostok, CO2. And um, yeah, we see time runs from, this is age, from zero to the past 420,000 years. And the spacing between two consecutive CO2 values, it is not a constant, it varies. And it varied between roughly, this is maybe 5,000 years, maybe it's close to 6,000 years. And this year is maybe a few years, a few decades. So, and the reason is that the archive did not accumulate at a, at a constant rate. There are periods where the accumulation was higher, a lot of material came in, and therefore you have the spacing. Um, I explained that in, uh, on the next uh, slide, is, uh, is higher. Uh, sorry, um, the spacing is, is smaller there in time, because the time, um, yeah, it, it's, it's smaller, the spacing. And we see also the other records. This is another ice core here. This is a marine sediment core. It is also not constant there. Here it varied between seven or so and uh, one kilo years and so on. And this is interesting thing. This is Vostok, deuterium. And we see here an increase down the, the core here. It's 420. We have a large spacing, okay, of maybe point, uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 okay um, maybe we make a well I give you some some um, we make a short break and then we in during the break you can think about and later we discuss why do we see this trend okay so this I, I just give short hints this is Antarctica and uh, sometimes we have snow, not often, it's a very dry place. And then uh, it accumulates, okay? And then we have uh, ice here, ice. And then we drill the ice core, also huge technological effort. This is therefore, it's old, 420 kilo years. And this is reasons, reasons. Okay, and usually one takes um, evenly spaced death samples, typically, typically 55 centimeters. One is here, here, and so on. 55 centimeter intervals. Okay, uh, but this is death. Okay, and then you have to think about time. How does this uh, look like in the, in the bottom part? So is it okay if we make a, a break, a short break, five minutes? So I will be back at 10.20 sharply, okay? Manfred, I just have to ask you about the reading assignment. Will you continue to lecture during this reading assignment period or? Depends on, I, I'm open to, um, more now, you want. Okay, you can continue the lecture. Okay. 
<laughs> they are really interested in the lecture. So yeah. during the reading assignments, you can continue with the lecture. And now we can have a five minute break. Okay, good. See you. Manfred, can we start? Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so before the break, we deal with the uh, Vostok um, core, the ice core, and uh, we are here with the, the recent and the, in the bottom we have the old eyes. We have 55 centimeter intervals and we are here at the depth of around uh, 3,600 and something meters. Okay, and uh, the question of mine was why do we see this increasing trend? Why is the spacing between two consecutive data points higher in the bottom than in the top. Has anyone an idea? Yeah, Rasto, right? We think that spacing is bigger because the eyes push lower layers with its weight. And then Julia, the lighter isotopes evaporated um, no, Julia, we are speaking just about the time scale. We are not speaking about any isotopes, just the ice material. It would be the same if uh, everything had the same um, isotopes, just H1 and O16. And Rasto and you, you found it alone. You, you say we, you, you had a discussion that you are you are working in the computer lab? Yes. Great. It's a good good finding. Exactly. Um, because the eyes will, uh, it has also properties of uh, liquids. It can flow. Okay. And if you press from here, um, then the, the layers get thinner and thinner, the yearly layers. And here they are, are bigger. Or sometimes you have beneath a bedrock, hard, and uh, then, uh, if, and then the ice flows, it, it flows this way, okay? And then you drill a, an ice core, and then um, you have to do seismic measurements to, to to find out this, and then to find a suitable place. And the ice flows, and people are in fact using models to determine the ice flow and to construct a, a good uh, time scale for the ice. So the ice cores are great. Um, informative tools for CO2 and they allow a high time resolution but uh, the big challenge as I see it is uh, an accurate time scale for the ice cores. Okay so we see that uh, uneven time spacing is uh, found in paleoclimate records ice cores and marine sediment cores but now let us look and we see well when do we observe even uh, spacing? Well, climate models, of course, they can produce evenly spaced series because, well, a climate model is a set, a big set, a very big set of equations, mathematical equations, which capture the essence uh, of, of the climate, the, the preservation of, of energy and momentum and the moisture transport and um, when in higher resolution you deal then with the land and the, the ocean and the bathymetry and the, the mountains and you have then the carbon cycle and the clouds and the clouds make a big <laughs> problems for the climate the modelers because they are rather small or some of them are small and it's difficult to resolve such small clouds in a mathematical model. Therefore you use what is called a parameterization which is an empirical relation. For example, if temperature is high, then this and this um, type of cloud forms, which has this and this radiative properties. And this is based on, well, on experience, on own measurements, but it's also uncertain. Um, okay, but um, the 
time spacing can well be uh, even for climate uh, computer model output. Is any one of you uh, considering to go into the field of modeling, climate modeling? Maybe it's a bit early, yeah, Julia? You can have the different types of, of, of models. I, I think in the book I give some in the background material. Let me see whether I have it. I give some, some background on climate models, not very, not, may, not very big. Page 19. I think no, no, perturbation, no, um, maybe I'll show you another book, excuse me for a second. Excuse. So this is a, a, another book I, I wrote, it's a statistical analysis of, of climate extremes, it is more recent, it is from, from last year. But I have not yet made a course on this. Um, it is published with Cambridge University Press and it's, uh, it's cheaper than this textbook we are speaking at the moment. And it has a chapter, an appendix chapter, on climate models. Um, well, evidently, I'm not a climate modeler, but I, I can speak with, with modelers. I know about their challenges and what they can achieve. And, uh, it's in general very helpful to collaborate with modelers. And also here in our Extreme Glim Twin project with modelers from Norway. And uh, you will, they will certainly tell you better than I am able to, to about these climate models. And the, the good thing is if we do a collaboration. So if people who do the modeling job collaborate with people who do the measuring job, and they jointly look on the, the climate and um, with the help of data analysis you find uh, interesting things, maybe a trend or an extreme value and then you try whether you are able or not to replicate such an event with the help of a climate model and jointly you can then proceed to better understand the, the climate. So as always in applied sciences and um, especially in climatology, it is a good thing to collaborate with uh, other people who have uh, other abilities. You can learn and um, extend your, your knowledge. Um, okay, this was a short excursion into modeling. Now we deal with the uh, observations. Daily temperature at uh, Novi Sad, made at uh, 7 in the morning. I don't know what is the typical time when the national weather services do their measurements. Maybe it's 8 o'clock, I have no idea. Anyone can tell me? If you listen in the, in the news, sometimes they tell you, in Germany, I, I always hear it's seven in the morning. Oh, we have three times a day, seven, two p.m. and yeah. nine. Okay, seven, yeah, thanks. Um, but uh, let us assume that uh, maybe on the, and, and someone is responsible for the measurements and at seven in the morning, maybe someone was um, responsible for that and he or she became ill and did not uh, notice fine. And therefore, um, one value at seven in the morning is missing. Okay, therefore you have then a, a missing value. This can happen with uh, observations, of course, but also with documentary data. Yeah? Also, if a new station has been um, 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 constructed and uh, they had problems with the machine and you can't believe uh, in the numbers for the first week because well it wasn't really well calibrated and you, you, you have to throw away the data and you can't use the data. Uh, okay, these are typical situations, observations with some missing values. This is also a case of uneven spacing. Um, then with proxy data, marine sediment cores, you can have what is called a jittered spacing. This is more or less evenly spaced, but you have a, a slight um, variations. Okay, sometimes a, a bit higher accumulation of the archive, sometimes a bit smaller. But you can also have with proxy data completely irregular spacing as with the ice cores. It really depends on how your archive accumulated. Okay, um, 
So these are typical situations and these are therefore rather the norm than the exception in my view if you speak uh, with paleoclimatologists. And also the, the, the weather people, the meteorologists, um, they also deal with missing values. And um, you have to be very careful if you are in such a situation um, because often um, people would um, generate artificial data and put it in as there were observations, but in reality there were no, no observations. Therefore it's a, a dangerous uh, thing and um, I will explain this on the next slide. So I have to take some time because it's uh, the figure 114 is full of information. So we read that figure from the top to the bottom. The upper scale is a, a time scale or age. We look on climate, the left is recent and the right is the past. And here, this is a typical um, range of time over which climate memorizes, okay? Maybe it's a, a week if you speak here about uh, weather, but it can also be years or kilo years or so. Now, we sample the climate using a natural archive. archive. And we, uh, for example, an ice core or a sediment core. That means we are now in the death domain. Yeah? We have each 55 centimeters, maybe a deuterium value, or each centimeter we have a, um, a marine sediment core value. You can't. You, you need some material for your machine, for the mass spectrometer, for the gas chromatograph machine to put it in. Therefore, you can't have a very very small uh, spacing. You have to have some material. Okay, now you also do what is called a dating. That means certain death points you put into another machine, the material in another machine, for example, into a uranium thorium mass spectrometer. Because then you count how many um, uranium atoms of a certain isotopic value you have, and also the thorium. Um, the, um, um, numbers and then you have the ratio and this uh, informs you about the, the age okay because well in a in calcium carbonate samples for example in spill themes at the beginning you have no thorium and then it goes older older and then the thorium increases it is a decay product of the contained uh, uranium and the older the sample the more thorium there is this is the principle of uranium thorium age determination. And of course, um, also radiocarbon. With radiocarbon, um, you generate radiocarbon in the atmosphere, and uh, you have a certain level that is being generated per time in the atmosphere. And then um, the 14C the radiocarbon makes it into the CO2, 14CO2 which is then taken up by the wood and then uh, the, the tree grows and now um, this uh, value here is locked off of the air and now the radiocarbon decays. It's a radioactive element. It has a half-life of 5,740 years roughly. Therefore, the older the sample, the fewer radiocarbon is there. So this is another example of a, a dating tool. Um, so, with the help of these absolute dating tools, the mass spectrometers, we are able to transform the age scale into a, uh, sorry, the death scale into an age scale, estimated age. And, uh, however, the archive did not accumulate at a constant rate. Sometimes we have more material per time unit and sometimes less. Okay, that means the archive, the time spacing is uneven. Okay, and these values here, the dark, the, the vertical lines, they are the averages of the, where the sample are taken from. And you see that they are unevenly spaced. Okay, so this depth spacing, D, 
of i is transformed, uh, sorry, the, the def spacing L of i is transformed into a time spacing, small d of i. Also shown here, this is uh, the length of uh, where your sample is from. Since you have to have some material, you have to invest certain centimeters or millimeters of, um, of depth. That means a certain um, number of years in age. And uh, with an ice core, even after deposition, um, be in mind this is uh, chemistry and physics, you have some diffusion of material outside and inside your sample. That means the time range seen by that um, proxy measurement is a bit wider. D bar, D prime, okay? This is the light shading. Okay, now you have these unevenly spaced series and um, what to do now? Well, if you are in, in my course here and then we, we stop, we are happy with an unevenly spaced series and we can have, and we use methods which are able to be directly applied to the unevenly spaced series. Of course, there exist other tools, other methods which require even spacing uh, some older methods of spectrum estimation, for example. And for having this, people use what is called um, sampling of the, and interpolation of the unevenly spaced series to an even spacing. But this is a dangerous thing. Let me explain. Um, so these are, the, these are the, where we have the measurements. And now you could be inclined to use the neighbored values, okay, and generate new values uh, in between, okay? So for example, um, you use this and that value, um, sorry, you use, excuse me, you use this value and that value to, to produce that value here, and then this one here again, okay? but you see that this value here has this neighbor and this neighbor and that value here has this neighbor and this neighbor again. So this neighbor here is shared by both evenly spaced values. That means you introduce a dependence between those here. It's an artificial effect. It is due entirely to the fact that uh, you do the interpolation. That means if that would be a series here, an unevenly spaced, without memory, the resulting interpolated series would have memory. Also there is none. So this would introduce um, dependence. And uh, depending on um, how strongly you interpolate, the effects can be stronger or weaker. Only in this situation here, you see that this value here has this neighbor and that neighbor. And the, that value here has this neighbor and that neighbor. So we, they have now no um, depends because they don't share a, a common neighbor. So you would call this downsampling. Um, and this situation where you have many data points evenly spaced, you would call upsampling. So this is a very dangerous thing. And to, to make it worse, people sometimes, in the past at least, they have generated more data points than they actually have measured. Okay? No one in the world can prevent you from generating very, very many evenly spaced uh, data points here. Uh, so, for example, you can generate uh, 10,000 data points, also your original values are maybe just uh, 500, a factor of 20. But this is uh, close to scientific misconduct, because you, you pretend that you have many more measurements. This is okay for if you want to do a visualization or something like this, but if you want to do statistical analysis, which uh, for which the sample size is of crucial relevance, then you, you can't do this because you would get so small error bars 
whereas in reality they are so big. And uh, therefore, um, you should not uh, do this. And therefore, it's, it is safer um, to use methods which can directly be applied to the unevenly spaced series. Um, I know that not all of my esteemed colleagues in paleoclimatology, they are happy to hear this because they or their students employ um, methods for even spacing and they do not care so much about this, but this is a reality and uh, we have to be very careful not to lean ourselves too far out of the window to get too small error bars. This is dangerous for the credibility of climate sciences. Okay, um, let me proceed and we are now um, close to the finish of this course and let me repeat um, this is what we have the time series our numbers maybe we downloaded it from an internet site our boss uh, had it maybe in, in, a, in a thesis contained and we are, have now the task of studying the series maybe you have measured it in, in your lab during your PhD or um, master thesis also, but we, we, you are interested in the climate, in this one, in the cap X. This is a process level. You make a statistical inference. You wish to learn about the data generating process, about the climate. And this technique is called time series analysis. This can mean you wish to estimate trend parameters, slope intercept, the probability of extremes, what is the chance of observing a Danube flood in excess of a certain threshold? And is it changing over time, such things? Or cycles, is there a daily cycle visible in the data, a yearly cycle? Are there more indications for cycles? And this can be done in a very simple setting, the universe setting, just one variable against time. You can already here start to do statistical analysis or in the book, I also do the uh, bivariate setting. You have two of those. Um, okay, so let me, I think they have more. So we are now still with the L with the lecture and later we, we do the tutorial T. Let me see whether there's more on this lecture. Okay, there's a, another thing on interpolation. With interpolation, you make a step away from the original data. And the original data are the best informants about the climate. Um, and therefore, we should be cautious. And here again is a, the Vostok CO2 record. Now we make a zoom on the interval from 30 to 80,000 years before present. And the original data points are in black. So one is, maybe I make it black, okay. Black. One point is here and the other is, is there. It is hidden be behind the others. Okay, and now you could be inclined to make a, a, a linear connection between the two and then you take the values at an even, uh, at an even spacing. Then you have an, a linear interpolation. But these curves have some, some sharp bends here and here. It is not smooth. And um, um, it has also less variability than the original series. Therefore, people um, consider also other interpolation methods, smoother, which yield smoother curves, such as the red curve, the cubic spline curve. It would lead us too far to define what is a cubic spline, but we bear in mind that this is a mathematical technique which gives you um, um, smoother curves. And you see that um, the red curve, um, sometimes it agrees well here with the blue curve and here as well, but sometimes you have deviations, okay? Um, and therefore it's not clear which interpolation method to take, whether the cubic spline, the linear one, and the, there exist also other interpolation tools. So this is an ambig ambiguity, which one to take. Therefore, this is another reason why to avoid interpolation, this uh, uncertainty about which interpolation method to take. And the danger, of course, is to take that method that gives um, 
results which are closest to what you wish to show. But you should get some independence of the, the results. Um, so for example, I myself, if I study climate extremes with full intention, I do not devote uh, so much um, um, values into what are the outcomes. I'm not interested in whether it gets worse or more expensive. And um, this with full intention, I leave to the, the, the people from the insurance industry. I want to know how much, I want to know the numbers. Um, and then they, the others can, can have it and then they make an interpretation. And this prevents me from um, being on one or the other side. So I try to be as objective as, as possible. Okay, let me proceed here. And uh, this is a, a table. It is from the book and uh, don't uh, try to, to go through the full um, uh, caption. We, we, we capture the essence of the table. You see that this is sample size and we study different things, different methods. For example, a method for calculating what is called a confidence interval. This is an interval that contains a certain parameter we wish to know and we can only make an inference on with the help of our sample. And it contains with a certain predefined probability that um, parameter. And here we speak about 95% probability. Okay, This is what our method, our confidence interval should achieve. And we can test the method using artificial data, entirely done in the computer, where we generate, um, with the help of a random number generator, um, artificial data, and then we, we apply a method or maybe two methods, so we can compare the methods. And then we look on what is the coverage of these um, confidence intervals. And um, I will come back um, later on this, this table, but you can then compare this uh, empirical coverage with the normal. And you see here that we have a, a very good agreement. So these are typical experiments I do with the methods to test the ability of the methods. And I, the, the good thing with the, with the, so this is a random number generator, therefore roulette. It is named after Monte Carlo. And um, it's a good thing because you know what to put in. You know the result and then you, that means you can test the methods. And you can also, the design of this experiment, the number of data points and the, the, the spacing of the time values perhaps and the persistence of the time values, they should be very or rather close to the data you are studying. Then you can transfer the Monte Carlo knowledge to the knowledge for your data. And if the method works well in the Monte Carlo, it will work again well for your data. This is way more um, reliable to test the methods than to make bold assumptions uh, and then to do some um, derivations based on analytical methods. Because in, in climate life, the assumptions are often violated, non-Gaussian shapes and persistence. And very often there is no theory. And therefore we have to do simulations. We will study in chapter three more on this uh, approach. So I will um, continue. And now we see that we are at the end of the introduction and we can make excursion into persistence models and also into the hardcore statistics chapter. But I, I would suggest that these are very short excursions to give you a chance to, to catch up with me. Okay, and uh, I should also mention that I produce the, the, the videos. Um, I think this is 15 videos for um, Extreme Klim Twin, where I, uh, well, you see me and speaking and uh, explaining things. And these are at the moment being done and this will become available within, within the project for the project participants. And um, 
Of course, you can also have a look at my, my website. I offer these courses also online, I think uh, from summer on. And uh, offline, well, we have the COVID and we have to wait until it's over. But I hope that better sooner than later, I will be able to host uh, participants here in my, my office uh, room. It's uh, big enough to have uh, eight or so people. So I have till now, I think, 32 courses. Um, and this is a course not only for chapters one to four, but for the full book, nine chapters. Um, so I'm curious how to proceed. Should we have a, a bit more on the on some data and I, I tell some stories on the data or are there questions by you in the chat or if you want to raise your hand or you can even speak in the microphone. So is there a Maybe I, I wait a bit uh, till you found a decision. I also am not sure how exhausted you am. Yesterday I gave the same lecture, but for what is called the, the experienced researchers. And we went through all four chapters in one day. And uh, it was rather uh, tiring for, for all of us. And um, I don't want uh, with you to do the same uh, tedious exercise. So. We will do some, I would suggest some tutorial later and then we, we do some excursions into the chapters and this we have to see whether we are able to do this. So is it okay if I, let me give, give me some time and I explain a bit about other data and uh, you can of course, um, maybe this course serves just for making you a bit hungry on, on climate and climate data and data analysis and paleoclimate, this is also okay. I'm not uh, at all offended. Then you can use the book, perhaps uh, the library has it, or maybe you want to even to buy it, or you come to a course of mine where you get it uh, cheaper. Um, then uh, you can study at home. This is not a bad thing if you have a good book. So let me proceed here. This is a, a record um, on the horizontal is a time axis, which is from the year 1000 to 2000. And on the vertical axis is a magnitude scale, one, two, and three. This is figure 1.2 from the book. And it is a record based on documentary data. And uh, what we see are floods. River Elbe floods in Germany, or at the border between Germany and, um, and Czech, well, it comes from the Czech Republic and then enters into Germany. Okay, and, um, and this one is a, a weak flood, this is a, a stronger flood, and this is a very strong flood, three. And the documents, well, they report about the occurrence of events. And this can evidently be studied using methods from extreme value analysis. This would be done in chapter six of the book, but I, I fear not today, would be too, too far advanced. Then this is an example which we deal with uh, in chapter four, regression. This is a, a marine sediment core record Measured is delta 18O, oxygen isotopic composition in the marine sedimentary samples. And this is there for four million years ago. And this is two, four million years ago. And we see ups and downs. And uh, one can argue that um, if that is high, this is much ice. Okay, because if that is, if you have a lot of ice, then a lot of ice is stored in the, in the, let me draw this again. If you are in a an, in glacial, then a lot of ice is here. And the, the ice contains much 18-0. Therefore, the, the water is 18-0 poor. And therefore, the ocean has a low delta 18-0. 
So he has a large delta 8 in O. As, uh, excuse me, I, I confused it. It has a low delta 8 in O. So, so this here is, um, this is much eyes. And this is low eyes. Okay, and uh, if it's getting warmer, then some of the water is released and it makes it into the ocean. And then it gets lighter and delta 8 in O gets smaller. And then we are, um, then we are here, though this is warm. Low ice and warm, and this is much ice and, and cold. So we see in the curve these ups and downs, and these are the ice, ice ages. Okay, and um, we see also a general trend, and it's getting heavier. And we can use a function, well, it's a model, so here and there and there. And we quantify this change point time here and there. This is done in chapter four, where we wish to estimate these change point times. This model is called the ramp. Okay, so the inference would be after the ramp parameters. Next example. Or interrupt me if, you, if I need to explain things again. This is um, radiocarbon um, against time. So the, we are speaking now about the past uh, 12,500 um, years or so up to the age zero. And um, what is zero age? Well, you have to define present. And uh, therefore you have to look into the papers. What is present? And in the radiocarbon community, very long present was defined as AD 1950. Okay. and. Um, you have to be aware that um, perhaps other researchers use other definitions of present. Therefore, you have always, if you work on recent time scales, maybe the past a couple of hundreds or maybe a few thousand years, what is present? You have to define it, that others um, know this and there is no error due to, well, different definitions of present. There exist other uh, communities, for example, in uranium, thorium, and they use often its AD 2000. And the age is then expressed in what is called B2K. So 2K is uh, 2000. Therefore, means the years before, or the year before 2K. This means the years before the year 2000. Okay? It's not a problem at all if you know what is present. Okay, and we see here radiocarbon content, and it also made some, some variations. And the variations, the book informs you, um, come from different uh, influences from uh, the climate. One influence is, uh, well, the, uh, the, the ocean currents. Well, because the, the ocean mixes and it interacts with the air, and usually what is in the ocean, the CO2 and the other um, forms where the carbon is contained, um, this decays, so radiocarbon decays. Um, and, the, okay, and it has a half-life of 5,740 years. And therefore, um, after a while, there is no radiocarbon left, and in the ocean, therefore, there is not so much um, radiocarbon. And therefore, if the mixing is stronger between the ocean and the atmosphere, then um, the, the atmosphere gets a certain amount of uh, radiocarbon, okay? Or radiocarbon poor material. Okay, so we see that um, also this uh, changed over time. And also, I should say, radium carbon also reflects uh, the activity of the sun. Because the sun, if that is the sun, this is the earth, and the sun um, sends light and um, 
and protons and uh, neutrons and, and, and stuff cross and, and galactic rays. And then in the atmosphere, um, in the atmosphere of the Earth, we have a 14 C, a 14 N, and if a, a, a proton or something like, like this um, meets the 14 C, then it generates the core reaction 14 C. This is the way how it has been generated. And, um, but also we have the, the cosmic galactic rays, okay, from the e exterior of our solar system. So the, the sun, this, what is called the solar wind, it interacts with this uh, mm -hmm. cosmic galactic rays. And this influences the production rate of our radiocarbon. So by measuring radiocarbon in the wood, you have also a clue about the solar activity in the past. And perhaps in school you have heard about the solar constant, the energy per time unit and area unit that is being sent us from the sun. But the, this term solar constant uh, is, is not true. It's not a constant. It varied also over time. It did not dramatically vary, but anyhow, it varied uh, to some degree. It is not a constant. And then this is an example from a Spilio theme. Um, oh, maybe I, you have a, maybe a, a cave, there's a soil and a precipitation and uh, the interacts with uh, the soil and then you have drip water, okay, and then uh, a stalagmite grows. And uh, this is young, this is old. You can also, then you, you people cut they take the stalagmite, if they are allowed, and um, bring it home into the lab. And they, 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 if that is the, the stalagmite, they, they usually cut it into a half. And then such a half, you see then the, the growth layers. And then using a dentist drill, you take um, material. And then you have also some material you take then for the uranium thorium. Um, age determination, and this gives you uh, such a curve, okay? And uh, this is an, a series from um, Oman, a cave close to the Indian Ocean, and uh, basically you see here the, the, the amount of rainfall. Again, this is a lot of uh, science behind the explanation of this uh, proxy Quality. So we are here in a, this is dry to the bottom and here it's wet. And the stalagmite began to grow at around 10,000 years or so. And then, it, and then it reached a wet plateau and then it gradually decreased. And we can quantify these change point times, for example. And this is a, a cold event, a dry and cold event. This is a 8.2 kilo year event. It was also, I think, I don't know exactly when it was a kind of found. Evidently, you need some good, re, well resolved data, many data points to, well, to find out the anatomy of, of that uh, cold interval. And to, then it's interesting, of course, to go over the globe and look for different places where you can find it. And then, Maybe they agree or not do not agree with the timing and, and the length of that interval. For example, here it's a bit long interval, and the question is maybe are there two events at around uh, 8.2 and 8.3 kilo years back in time at Oman? Um, so these are questions you can study with the help of, uh, for example, extreme value analysis. Then you would detect these extremes and quantify the dates and uh, how strong the events are. So these are questions um, the Spilio themes ask us. More? Okay, this is, uh, um, yeah, let me give you also this example. This is uh, from the year 1000 to the year 1900. This is warf thickness. What is a warf? This is an annual layer in a lake. Um, 
Okay, so in a lake sediment. So, okay, let me draw a map. So this is um, maybe USA. Okay, and this is Boston. I lived in Boston for a year. And close by is a lower mystic lake. Okay, and uh, colleagues from Amherst, Massachusetts went there and they drilled a core, maybe I, I show this, uh, a core into the lake and uh, they observed layers, dark bright layers and dark comes usually from organic stuff and uh, uh, that means uh, things have to grow, yeah, biology and so this is in summer and then this is dark and then um, it's bright not so much organic stuff, more siliciclastic, siliciclastic, yeah, stones and um, um, yeah, um, fine grained stone. Um, and this is more in winter. So you have these dark bright layers and you can count them. And this gives you a, a counted age. And occasionally you can, you find perhaps wood contained in the layer maybe here or there and this you can put into radiocarbon measurement and then you see whether or not it agrees with what you uh, counted. So this gives you then an age um, control. But here we are interested in, the, in, these, in these events, in the thick valves, okay? And why does a, a thick valve occur? Maybe let me take another color, maybe a red one. And, and now um, the hurricanes are low pressure systems they um, so that the air rotates this way and they also they move they along the Atlantic Ocean and sometimes they hit the uh, USA they are costly events Katrina in uh, 2005 it cost uh, b billions of dollars uh, we are speaking about and they usually they are located in this uh, in this southern US area but sometimes they make it even as far north as uh, New England, Boston. And, um, and there are reports from the, well, from the settlers, you know, Columbus, 1492, and uh, then the people, the Western people, they spread. And um, we have documents from the colonization of the Boston area and also reports about hurricane events, for example, here at 1630. So there are documentary data and there are measurement data from the VAF thickness. So, um, and jointly, um, um, this can help us to make a, a, a good um, record of past hurricane activity. So the task in section six or chapter six of the book would be first to detect the extremes by means of placing a threshold and then just uh, analyzing these extreme events and then counting how many events per time unit do we have and is there a, a change over time. So this would be an example from, um, uh, from extreme climate events. But more on that, uh, um, will be brought by the scissory by, by Silman on, on I think it's it's Friday. Well, let me see when I, I have here the, the plan. It is Jana Silman on uh, I think on the 21st of um, this is next week, is it? 21st? What is the day? 13th? Yeah, it's next week. Okay, uh, you will see whether she will touch the paleo extremes, likely not, then you speak with her more about uh, the recent extremes. Um, but the thing you should ask her is, um, what is, if the extremes generating process, is it stationary or not? Do the extremes occur more and more often or not? Is it stationary or not? I hope that she will uh, give you some examples and um, methods to, to analyze such questions. So my book 
has such methods and therefore I'm happy to collaborate with Jana and the others in this extreme twin project. So because this project deals with the extremes, temperature extremes, heat waves or cold extremes perhaps as well, cold spells and also floods or um, which are extremes in, in well, precipitation derived um, properties in river runoff. Okay, but you can also of course study um, precipitation extremes. But precipitation is rather challenging to properly analyze because, well, it has a, a large spatial variability. It may rain here, but in the next village it may be dry. Depends on what type of rainfall you have. It's a bit um, more difficult to analyze. Oh, sorry, I, I, I respond to the question in a, sec in a second. It's more difficult to analyze precipitation because of the spatial variability. Um, it rains here while it does not rain there. On the other hand, temperature has a larger spatial memory. Okay? If it's warm here, it also will be warm uh, in the next uh, city or so. Um, therefore, it's, uh, temperature data are kind of easier to analyze. So a big challenge, perhaps some of you wish to study precipitation extremes in the future and you have to have good data quality and thanks to the satellites you are will become into a position to have very many highly resolved highly in time and highly in space precipitation data so let me study the the question in the chat by rasto could this peak be made by animal activity and how if they can how can we conclude it's an extreme climate event or some local disturbance? Well, it's a good question, but, um, uh, well, the answer is it can't be animals because then you would not uh, see these nice uh, dark bright layers. You, you can't see it. I think I have, no, I, I don't have a, a photo. It's contained in the book. It's in, um, somewhere in, in, the, in, the, in the introduction. Animals, that means, for example, worms or well, mainly worms, they, they eat the material and uh, they take what they need and they digest it and they, they mix it. And um, they have a certain range uh, if they are about their mix and they, they would certainly destroy this dark bright layering. For, so for this um, data set, it's not a problem. But f let me go back to the marines core, this core, with uh, marine sediment records, uh, these animals, the paleoclimatologists call that bioturbation, then they may indeed mix the material. And uh, this uh, puts a limit to what we can see. So it's a good question, but it's more a problem for the, for the marine sediments than for, for this type of, um, of event. I, I do not, certainly not wish to say that uh, there are no lakes uh, for which that is not a problem. It depends also on the lake. Maybe it's a better answer by me than to say uh, all the lakes are, are good. It's not, not true. There exist bad lakes in that sense. Um, if oxygen is rich, then um, the animals can survive and then they can mix. But if you have very um, poor oxygen content, then it's a kind of a close to dead zone. And then uh, there are no uh, animals who can uh, do the bioturbation. I think this is a better answer. It depends on. For example, where I live in the, I live in lower uh, Saxony and we are not so far away from the Baltic Sea, okay? And uh, this is uh, known that we have not so much oxygen there. And uh, therefore, you can have um, situations where you have um, uh, nicely laminated uh, sediments. Okay, um, so good, good question for, for paleoclimatology. Let me proceed whether there are more. Okay, um, this is another example of um, a bivariate uh, series by that means um, this is one um, well 
These are two, two time series. It's not a Bible. These are two univariate series. This is better to say. Time scale is now the 20th century. And uh, we see here runoff. Runoff is volume water per time unit. Cubic kilometers per year. Okay. It is a runoff in the Arctic area. Uh, and it is not measured. It's modeled. So it's a model output. And um, so it's a very sophisticated model um, done by the Hadley, Hadley Center in England. Um, and they have a representation of the water cycle in the model and of the atmosphere and uh, I think also of the carbon cycle. And the study they wish to make was in this panel here, we have no greenhouse gas changes. That means, in a sense, without humans, without um, combustion of fossil fuels, no rise in CO2, and no changes in greenhouse gas, the same forcing, the same greenhouse gas forcing, same temperature, essentially, in the model. And here, it is with greenhouse gas changes. That leads to a temperature rise. In the temperature, a warmer atmosphere can carry more water. This is physics. This is called the clausius clapeyron equation. Yeah? Uh, and if it's getting colder, for example, then the, the, the clouds uh, rain out and they, they lose their water. And if it's warmer, they can carry more water. Okay? Um, and therefore, if we have the humans, we have greenhouse gases, we have temperature rises, then we have also more water in the atmosphere and uh, it can uh, rain heavier and it can produce larger runoff. And the question the guys wanted to answer in their paper was, um, can we model that? What does a model response look like? And this is it. Um, and in the tutorial, for regression four, chap regression one, chapter four, we would fit here a change point model. It's constant here and constant there. And we would look for this change point time. Okay. On the other hand, for that model, we would just fit a, a straight line to the data, a linear trend. Okay. So this would be the task then of inferential statistics. We could, we have to see whether we will make it to that. Maybe we, we do this because uh, several of you work on recent climate. Um, we try to do this uh, maybe in the, in the afternoon. So this was an excursion to the, to the 20th century and the recent uh, past. That's wrong. Um, again, this is also the 20th century. We see temperature anomalies for two places. Uh, one is, I think, from Siberia measurements and the other is a sea surface temperature. Uh, I have no idea. I, I forgot it at the moment. I think I have no idea. I think this should be this should be the, the ocean sea surface. Why do I think this? Because this is just uh, four degrees amplitude. Uh, whereas on, on land you can have pretty larger I'm not sure whether I'm, I'm right here. I'm not sure. Well, it is anomaly. I ha Let me see what is anomaly here. This is figure 111. I have to, to check it. Maybe I talked a nonsense. I have no idea. Yes, I'm, I'm right. This is Siberia. And this is uh, the, um, the North Atlantic. Okay, and then, um, well, these are gap-free data, so no problems with missing observations. And, um, okay, and then uh, you can study, is there a relation between both? You can make um, plots and uh, such uh, things. 
You can also look then in the tutorial uh, for the memory of that series. Maybe we do this in the tutorial as well. So, okay, let me see, is there more? Okay, this would now be a record again, 20th century. This is now um, runoff. Q is a hydrological um, abbreviation for runoff. Uh, in the river Elbe and the units are cubic meters per second and A is for the station Dejin and this is for the station or the city Dresden and this is a further bit downstream in Germany this is Barbie and then you can study the correlation between the series at Dresden and Barbie and Dresden and Dejin. Correlation means the co-variation. If Dresden is high, is Barbie then also high? And to put that into a quantitative number, the correlation coefficient. This is then uh, from the bivariate setting. And uh, I I'm afraid we don't have the time to do this. But chapter seven gives you some uh, information on that. So you should take not only my lecture, but uh, take also the, the, the book. Okay, so we are really now at the end of this in introduction. Before we make uh, another short break, we have to see how long we wish to make. Uh, are there questions, comments? Should I repeat? Anything? <laughs> snails? No. Interesting. So Milica asked whether I have experience with snails. No, um, I, I know that uh, you, you use uh, mollusks, um, so bivalved, they contain also um, material on which you can measure isotope, which gives you a, a handle on, on the past climate. I myself have certainly, I have no experience um, myself. I, I think I, I have a, I know a colleague, Bernd Schöner from Frankfurt, who is an expert on, on such a type of uh, data. Uh, I myself, I'm afraid I focus on, on methods. Um, but yeah, other questions? Um, I see you are typing, I think, Militia. So let me see. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about it. I, I can't see so many of you. I have Branislav, Tanya, Tirana, Dragana, Rasto, Militia, and Seljika, but uh, this is just a picture. And I'm not sure whether all of you for which I don't see the, the video are still there. Christina is now here. Um, is it okay if we proceed with the second chapter? Should we make the tutorial for chapter one? Maybe we do the tutorial. And I will be very slow and um, to give you a chance to do some very basic exercise. Or would you prefer to have some, some reading material? So you have a, a laptop with you and you can do some exercises. So let me proceed with the tutorial for, for, for the, the first, for the introduction. It will be a, a very basic, okay, exercises, good. Um, and uh, tell me if I'm too, 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 too fast. 
So we try, now it's half past uh, 11. Maybe we have to see, we have a break at, uh, at 12 o'clock. Yeah, okay. So we do a, a bit of exercises and maybe you wish then to uh, proceed with that. Now we are in tutorial T. And uh, the first thing I want you to do is to download the data file. The data file is that one which contains that data points. The data file is called 1-3b.txt. It is contained in that folder, folder data, and you have to use a, a certain editor to, um, well, to open the file. It can be a text editor, it can be uh, another software, a spreadsheet software, it can be Excel, and I think I myself uh, will now uh, open it um, using a, a graphic software, a commercial software, it is called a grapher. I use it for making plots. You can either watch me how I do it or you do it yourself. So I will open the file and I look how does it look like. Because this is the usual thing what I have to do, what I always do, if colleagues send me data. They send uh, it in the different uh, formats and uh, I have to, to, to make it uh, that it can run on my machines. It has to be in a, in a text format. It should have a decimal point, not a decimal comma, as we Germans have it. And no thousand commas or other separators. And it, it, you, you should have also two entries per line, okay? The first is age and the second is the value. And uh, it should ideally also have no missing values. Okay, so I will check this and I will therefore make it... Uh, I go to this uh, software. This is called Grapher. You have a demo version on your um, machine. Um, it's not the same version, I beg your, your pardon. If there are problems, uh, let me know in the, in the chat. I will now open the file, 1-3b.txt file, open. By the way, maybe I, sh I show you. I use a sheet of paper and I, I make my notes. So if I do an analysis, I, I write down what I do because it's so easy to get lost. You do another transformation and soon you have forgotten if you, if you do not take your notes. It is as important as if you work in a, in a laboratory to take and you take, have a lab book Take also your notes with you and, um, and store them with you. It can be electronic notes in a, in a laptop or, or it can also be, of course, a sheet of paper. But it's very important um, not to move too fast but to document what you are doing. Okay, so I will open now this data file 1-3b.txt file, open. Now I have to check where it is. It is in my projects folder. This is a company. These are the projects for the company. This is a, the Extreme Glim Twin. This is now the training. These are the workshops. Now we are here and the, here is a folder with software. You have it. And there's also a folder with data and I will now open the data folder. Maybe I make this a bit, is it possible? No, I can't make this bigger. You see, these are all the data from the, from the book. For example, this is for figure 1.1, this is figure 1.2. Um, okay, and I will now open 13b.txt and open. Okay, this I'm being asked and this is okay. And now, we see the series. We have in one line two values. This is age in kilo years before present. 
of course the units are, have disappeared, you just have the numbers. And these are the CO2 values. But the first data point has an age of 2.342 um, kilo years. And the value there is 284.7 ppmv. Let me go further down. And the last data point is at a 4. 114 kilo years and uh, this is the value there okay and um, okay then I would check for example I would mark those here and then I would look data statistics evidently um, with your software it may look in a differently you have to but it would be great if you during the course would discover which software you wish to to have okay I, here i put in this stuff and you see that there are no data in column z and um, nothing is there you only have column a and column b okay this is a this is b and uh, we see that we have 283 data points and no missing values. So this is good. Then the next thing I want to do, or what I usually do, is I check whether these values here are strictly monotonically increasing. Because this is again what I assume, or what the software reads. Uh, for example, some colleagues sent me data where you have identical time points. Well, then I have to ask them, what happened here? Do you have made two measurements? And how should we proceed? Should we take the average of those? Is there a, a reason why to throw away one of them? So um, I have to ask them, because this is not my duty, it's their duty. They have to care about uh, the, the numbers. So let me now check whether the time increases strictly monotonically and I do this by making a copy of that Control Z copy and I paste it there shift it by one No, it did not work. I have to check this Okay, now I'm here and now I make. I, I'm sorry, uh, Miloche is here. Uh, just a second. We have a small technical problem, so they, they have to uh, start the program. And I, I think uh, some of them have difficulties starting the program. So uh, if you could just a few seconds to, to spare to give them a time to, to start the program. Yeah, good. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then let me go back and uh, so this if you are using the demo version for Grapher 10 then it would go via cells and then statistics this would bring you to a similar um, type of data input and analysis Uh, it seems that we, we solved this problem, so, so please. Uh, yeah, good. Thanks Thank for interrupting. So I'm now back here. This is now the copy of that shifted by one. Now I make a transformation. I say F is equal to A 
minus d. So then I calculate the difference between two consecutive time points. So I go to data transform and now this opens and I go to the seconds to the transform equation and now I use the keyboard and type in F with or without space I put a space to make it uh, legible for you equals a minus b uh, sorry my thought a minus d <coughs> excuse me and then I press enter and I see these numbers this is a spacing so this number here, 1.292, this is the difference between data point 2 and data point 1, between 3.634 and 2.342, and so on. Okay, so these are smaller values, okay, and this is then the, the last one. And now I make the same descriptive statistics, maximum, minimum, and so for this spacing. Data, uh, statistics, well, this I keep and I press enter. And the thing I look at is this one here, 0.043, that means it is positive. The times are always increasing. If they would be not increasing, if they would, if there would be an one or more instances where time would be constant, duplicate measurements, then the minimum would be zero. But the minimum is positive, greater than zero. Therefore, time is strictly monotonically increasing. Mathematicians would call a series which may increase or may be constant a, a increasing, a, or sorry, a monotonically increasing time scale, but not a strictly monotonically increasing time scale. So the word strictly um, regards the case of zero. So this is okay. It looks as it should. So I will, is it okay if I now proceed back with the lecture? So this was the, the first thing in the green box, the exercise. And now we proceed. And uh, well, we had already this discussion about the challenge to make an accurate time scale for the for the ice core, okay, because of the flow of the material and you use flow, ice flow models and such things. We had also discussed uh, the compaction. So let us proceed and do some other exercise. And this is now the major exercise for the remainder. This morning we make histograms. I already told you a histogram you basically just look how many values are within a certain size class. And um, you can use Grapha or Excel or R or MATLAB or own written software to make a histogram. Well, I think few of you perhaps have done an own software on making histograms, but um, Maybe you wish to try um, the Grapha demo, or you can also use Excel. And I will in a second open this data file 1 minus 3b minus res.txt. And this file 
No, it's my phone. Well, I'm not able at the moment to do this, which I don't understand. Um, I will proceed now and uh, do the exercise on this file one minus three b rest dot txt and um, sorry. I will first go to the to the grapher and do the exercise. I will press this stuff here, and now I go to the to the other file one minus three b rest or txt. I get I throw away this one. I don't need this file. Open one minus three b rest dot txt and enter and I press OK and now I have this um, this is again the time series time these are this second column are down the residuals I have removed already the trend and the seasonal cycle and what remains uh, are, so to say, the residuals, the numbers which represent the noise component. And those I put now into a histogram. Okay, so I'll, I will make now um, a plot, new graph, 2D graph, histogram. I'm, uh, if I remember correctly, this demo version, you have to find I think this goes via um, via cells, but you have to you have to check. I, I beg your pardon, and please let me know. Okay, the questions. Unit I already answered these questions. The unit for column A are kilo years. The units are for B are ppmv parts per million by volume milliliter. Okay. More questions? Okay, let me again do the, use the column B, the residuals, for making a histogram. It's a 2D XY graph, a histogram. And now uh, it, it opened, okay? Maybe I make this a bit, you can, I make this a bit, I want to make this smaller. Um, so, okay, now this is uh, the histogram and I, I increase it uh, a bit. It's a bit confusing with this machine. Okay. We see now the histogram, it runs from minus 50 to plus 50. This is not exactly the maximum and the minimum of the points. Well, let me show you the maximum and the minimum. This is, uh, is the data file, min minus three. Okay, answer to Rasto. PPMV is not negative, it is a, a unit. The values are negative because they are the anomalies. Therefore, you can have negative values. Yeah? Some of the values are positive and some are negative. On average, they are around zero. 
Okay, now the this stuff here, the statistics for that. Minimum is minus 44.088 and maximum is 48.4087. Okay, I go back to the plot. And you see that Grafa did not uh, take the minimum and the maximum. Therefore, I'm not completely happy. But uh, it is okay for the moment. And now we play. We play with the free parameter, namely the width of the bins. No one in the world uh, can prescribe us why we should take 10 ppmv spacing. We can also take other spacing. And this is what I will do now. I right click. I use the mouse and the right mouse button to click on the plot. And now I can change the properties. And this property manager opens. And I want to make this bigger. And I open the bins. And uh, okay, and uh, now I change the number of bins and the bin size as well. Let me take a hundred more bins, uh, ten times more bins, and the size is smaller. It's a value of one. Okay. Now we see very many bins here and uh, it's difficult to learn something. For example, do we think really that there is something that in reality there is a, a, a hole? That means no filled bins. Um, or this one is also empty. It's difficult to learn from so, so many bins in my view. Let me go in the other direction and reduce the number of bins. Right click. And now we um, take, uh, for example, um, 10 bins. No, we had just had 10. Maybe we take two bins uh, and they are spaced by 50. Five, zero, enter. Okay, well, it's also not informative. Um, there are some data points. This is all you can say. You can't learn very much from this. So you see that um, things can go also wrong with uh, the histogram. And uh, you have uh, a chance to make a good plot if you select a good number of bins. And uh, this is mathematically an interesting thing. And let me show you a formula how to approach that bin with problem. This is a formula, it's page 135. And we have um, the histogram. And we saw that we have a, a problem, namely the selection of the bin width. So this is a fundamental problem in statistics. It is also called the smoothing problem in this context of density estimation. Yeah, we want to estimate the density or to have a clue about how the density looks like. And therefore, we make the histogram. But there is a, a rule and the rule is by that paper, in that paper by Scott, 1979. And this is the rule the optimal bin width for a normal distribution. Now what, before we turn to the formula, what does it say, optimal bin width, normal distribution? Well, Scott was able to show that if the true underlying distribution is a normal or a Gaussian, then the difference between the histogram points and the normal distribution 
you have to somehow measure it, for example, the Euclidean distance, then the distance is a minimum if you select this bin width. It's clear, if you have just two bins, then you have a very strong deviations from the Gaussian shape. And if you have very, very many, then you have very unfilled zeros, which are also then uh, deviations from the Gaussian shape. Therefore, somewhere in the, in the middle is a good uh, solution. And this is Scott's rule. So what does this formula tell us? We have 3.49 times, and then this quantity S index n minus 1. This is explained here. And then times n to the power of minus a third. Okay? n is sample size. We know this. This is... Um, let me go back and uh, show you. Or maybe we go to the, to the graph. Huh? It's, it's, it's better to do this. Therefore, I, I go here. Make this small. Go to this. And we go down there. And we see that we have 283 points. Okay, so back to the lecture. Now I will calculate this expression and I use my, my pocket uh, calculator. Okay, 283 to the power of minus a third. This is 0 0.7479 and so on. Let me check this again. No, sorry, I, I made a fraud. This is 0.15. I will double check it again. I'm not. Yeah, it is 0 0.15. This is 0 0.15. Okay, now we have to calculate this thing here, Sn minus 1. What is this? This is a formula. It is called sample standard deviation. Um, these are our data points. We have them. This is sample size. We know this. This is a summation sign, and the counter is i, okay? And we have another thing here, x bar. This is defined here. It is called sample mean. So sample mean, you just take your values, you sum them up, add them together, and then you divide by their number. This is the average. You certainly have done this in school or university. Um, and this you plug in there. And then you look, what is the difference between a data point and the average? You can, sometimes you have higher than average values, sometimes you have lower values. But if you square the difference to the average, it's always a positive value. So this is the idea behind taking the square. It does not matter whether you are below or above the average. Then you do this for all points, okay? And the higher the spread of the points, the larger is this expression. You finally divide by, by n minus 1, okay? And if you ignore for a second this, uh, that you take the square root, then the units of that expression would be the units of x squared. As a physicist, I prefer, it's easier for me to, to, to grasp, if, the, if that expression has the same units. Therefore, I take the square root of, this, of the full expression. Then this has the same units as uh, the x units, namely PPMV. Okay? So this is called sample standard deviation. This is an estimator for the spread, and this is a technical statistical term, it's called standard deviation 
of the distribution. It describes the width of the distribution. Okay, and I will now use Grapha to calculate these sample standard deviation and then I plug it in into the Scott formula. So I will now go back again to Grapha. I will go to the top and um, mark this column here. Now I, now I go to data and statistics. You have been there with cells and statistics. And I, I check here, I can move this, um, yeah. And you see that it is being there, standard deviation. So it's good. And I press enter. And the thing I want to know is this one here. The other things I don't, uh, I'm not interested in. This is 17.5431. Evidently, this is just a number, but if you want to write it in a paper, you would write the standard deviation is 17.5431 ppmv. This is the correct way to express this. Okay, so let us now um, use uh, the formula. And therefore, we have to calculate, and I fully uh, write it, the bin width is uh, 3.49 times times 17.5431 ppmv, which is 61.221, and the ppmv times 283 to the power of minus a third times 0.15. This is 9.18. Okay? And um, hence the full. Okay, this is. Yeah, the difference between maximum and minimum. And therefore, if you take then the difference between maximum and minimum and divide it by the optimal bin width, then you obtain a value very close to 10. Okay, and since the number of bins has to be an integer, yeah, seven or eight or nine or 10 or 12 or 100, um, you have to round and use then the rounded integer. That means you, we take 10. 10 classes is a good choice. So we see that a grapher has implemented a routine for um, bin width calculation, which is uh, giving results close to what Scott advises us. Um, I've tried myself to study the tutorial by Grafa, but they would not uh, tell me. Therefore, it's not a, a good, it's not a good way of doing science. You have to give the full information, give the sample the data values and uh, give the, the algorithms, the, the, the formulas, so that others can clearly replicate the numbers you obtained. By the way, we are at the moment discussing about the data management plan for our project and there we also have, a, a, we, we really strive for making our science uh, reproducible. That means we supply other researchers with our data. We deposit it in a data bank um, or we attach it to the paper and in the supplementary material to the paper, other researchers and students can find it. And then we also document on, a, on what I call an algorithmic level, that means at a very precise level, which documents all the calculation steps. At this algorithmic level, we also document our methods. So other people can use either our software, which implements our algorithms, or if they prefer, they can um, program it themselves and put in these algorithmic steps. And given the same data, they should obtain, hopefully, the same results. So this is mandatory in today's science to allow others to reproduce what we did. This um, 
increases the credibility of, of our science. We do not hide our data. We do not uh, hide our methods. We tell the world and the others what we are doing. Okay, this is an open-minded approach to science. Um, so I think we are, we should now be uh, having, there is a, a second uh, task, but I don't do that here. Maybe in the break, some of you wish to try to make a scatter plot. So the data file is 1 minus 10 B dot txt, and you, there you have the X values and the Y values. Um, uh, sorry, so my fault. You have the, the X values, the North Atlantic temperature uh, values, and you can make a scatter plot to visualize persistence. If you wish, it would be great to see your plot. We had the compaction already discussed. And um, well, let me ignore this one here. And finally, let me conclude this morning session uh, with an advice. Um, the computer helps us. Uh, we can calculate things and we can write uh, papers and we can make plots. It's a bloody machine. It's nothing spectacular, it's a machine. And uh, we should you should, at your stage of your career, perhaps now is a good time to think about what tools you want to stick with um, for, the, for a longer term of your career, maybe the full career, because you have to become masters um, using these tools. Okay, I, I just uh, explained what tools I uh, came, came across. Um, I like the Windows machines because I can easily install the software, but uh, I don't make a religion of that. Uh, other people um, like the Macs or the, the, the big workstations running under Linux or something like this. Also other gurus are taking um, Linux and notebooks and so it's okay. You have to be happy with your computer system. Um, Fortran is a language, a computing language for making fast calculations. So the big climate models, they run in Fortran or maybe in C. So C and Fortran, the only two options for making fast uh, calculations. Then I, I still like my pocket calculator because I can quickly calculate numbers. And uh, you see that I occasionally use also Grapha for visualization and um, doing some spreadsheet um, analysis. Excel certainly is also possible to use, but you have to be aware, I, I think I can say this, with some statistical um, methods, may, one should be cautious regarding Excel. I take that liberty. I mean the calculation of the p-value for the correlation coefficient. I'm pretty sure uh, that this makes assumptions which is um, are maybe a bit dangerous to make, um, namely a Gaussian distribution. It leads us to five, I explain more here. Then graphics, important. You um, have a, a supervisor and you have reviewers of your papers and your um, project proposals, which are humans, and the humans like to see good plots and you should invest time into making good plots. Grapha is certainly a, a powerful tool. You can play with the design of the axis and what fonts you use, how thick to make the ticks, and what um, and the, the, the color of the plots and everything. It's not, um, of course, it's cosmetic, but you have to, to convince um, and um, yeah, win the hearts of the reviewers. Okay, then uh, GNU plot is a, a quick and dirty graphics viewer for visualizing output files that I use the software for for interactive working with my Fortran software, because Fortran is not very well in doing proper plots and um, graphics output. Therefore, I use a um, new plot in conjunction with Fortran. And in design, I prefer over, for example, Word or PowerPoint for making slides, because this is a um, um, design software which uh, allows you to place PDFs and um, without a loss of resolution and so. So it's a, a good thing and so these um, slides here I made using InDesign and I put then um, parts of my book and I gave them a, a yellow background and I, they are still uh, legible. 
Okay, so you have to think about your data. What are the questions you want to study and what are the tools you wish to employ for answering the questions? So this, uh, I would say this is now the place to conclude this uh, morning session. I thank those of you who stayed uh, active. I thank for your questions. Um, well, if there are immediate questions now, let me know. You can also type it in the chat. I have it here. Otherwise, we would meet then at yeah half past one. Okay. So I think I will now um, drop out later. Log in again and see you then at half past two. Bye-bye.